You know, whether it's over lunch or talking after church or in email traffic, uh, my time spent with the membership here, uh, a lot of conversations after we get past football and this, that, and the other, uh, a lot of conversations drift towards the, the state of our country and, and talking about some of those things and talking about uh, the declining moral standards and how things are different than when we were growing up. And also there's some concern about the economic status of our nation and also some of the gridlock among some of our elected officials. And there, it, there just seems to be kind of a, a polarization going on. And that, that's never been at this height before. And so this brings about a lot of anxiety in, in people's uh, thoughts. But matched with this anxiety is this desire to want to do something. What's something we can do to, to help our country? And so I, I think if, if we are people of, of the, the Word and we're people of God, then the first thing during times of national concern, people of faith are called to get down on their knees. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-3, through 3, Paul tells him the first thing, not the last thing. The first thing I want you to do is to pray. Pray every way you know how for everyone you know. Pray especially for the rulers and their governments to rule so well that we can be quietly about our business of living simply in humble contemplation. This is the way our Savior God wants us to live. So I'm going to invite you to, to join me in this leadership in uh, this 40-day prayer guide for our nation as we head into our election season. So beginning Friday, September 28th, is when you can start reading this, and that will take us right up to uh, Tuesday, November 6th, the day of election. And so this is just a simple prayer guide, and it has some inspirational things, but uh, each day has a, a passage and then a prayer to accompany this. And certainly you're not limited to just reading this, and uh, there are lots of different things, but... It's just a primer. It's a way for us to think about these things in a disciplined way. And also, as a body of believers, to, to humble ourselves before our Heavenly Father in asking Him to be a part of this. Now, I, I want to give a little disclaimer. We are not pushing any one candidate, or we're not pushing any one party. We're simply trying to say that we're God's people, and we want to put this before Him as something that's important. You know, I, I think of Simon the Zealot, who was a part of uprisings, trying to uh, strategically and politically take out the Romans some of them in very violent ways. If, if he can sit at, at, at the same campfire with, with Matthew, the tax collector, a sellout who was working for the Romans, if they could put all of those things that, that were so important to them aside because of the cause of Christ, certainly Democrats and Republicans can worship on the same pews and attend the same churches. And we can also put that aside to say we just want as believers to come before our Heavenly Father. And that's what I'm asking us to do, is to spend some time petitioning our Heavenly Father over the next 40 days. So at the end of service, our ushers are going to be passing these out. Take one, one per family. If we have some left over, uh, then we'll certainly give these, uh, make them available for whoever would like to give them to a coworker or whatever. Let, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you, you've given us this promise that if we, your people, will humble ourselves and pray and seek your face, and Lord, also to turn from our wicked ways, and you will forgive our sin, and you'll heal this land. And Lord, that, that's what we're asking. Lord, we do not feel like we have a monopoly on your love or your name. But Lord, we do pray for the USA. And Lord, looking at those letters, we ask that you unite us, we ask that you strengthen us. And Lord, that we ask that you anoint our coming president, whomever that is who's elected, with wisdom and strength and a heart for you. Lord, we ask this all in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Of the top ten most recognized Bible stories, these are people that maybe don't spend a whole lot of time in Scripture, but of the top ten Jonah and the whale, they don't get on to me. That's what people that don't know Scripture call it. Jonah and the whale is a big fish. Yeah, we don't know. Probably a whale. We're not going to land there as a body. Okay, but Jonah and the whale is at number five. The number five most recognized story. 
And there's something about that that the folks that, that don't even go to church like about this, the idea of a reluctant prophet that, that's called by God to go uh, preach to the people of Nineveh, but somehow finds himself on the wrong boat and then ends up in the belly of a big fish. Well, instead of me telling you the story, I thought it'd be interesting for you guys to hear the telling of the story from some of our kids here at Twickenham. So let's take a look at this video. God told Jonah to go tell God told Jonah to go and um, God told jo Jonah to go to Nineveh but he didn't go and tell the tell the bad guys to stop Jonah didn't want to tell to the people to stop doing bad things. He, he, and he was scared, so he tried to run away. Jonah ran away from God when he told him to go to um, this place. And he got on a boat, and he went on a boat, and it started this storm, and, and all the people threw him out, out of the ship. And everyone threw him and he got swallowed by a whale. He got caught in a whale when he, um, they threw him off the ship. And for three days we've been praying to God about, about if he could get out of the ship. After his three days, he, he um, got spit out. Then when he got out of the big fish's tummy, he went to where God said to go. And he went and he had a mission from God. Jonah went to Nineveh and the people were sad and um, then he went and told the bad guys to stop. And God decided not to destroy them. Jonah was mad so so he went to the desert and said, I'm doing a tree for shade. Jonah was very happy about the vine but when the sun came up it burned up the vine. Jonah got mad because the vine burned. Jonah said I'm not angry enough to die. God asked Jonah which one was more important, the people or the vine. This is the story of Jonah. All right, let's give him a hand. Good job. Do we know anything about this character Jonah? I mean, outside of this story? Actually, we do. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to backtrack a little bit in our cover to cover. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 14. 2 Kings chapter 14. Uh, hopefully, it'll give us a little bit of insight into what we're talking about today. We're going to learn a little bit about this reluctant prophet who was commissioned by God to go and, and preach to his people. But here in, in 2 Kings chapter 14, we're going to read in this passage that the word Lord comes to Jonah, son of Amity, from a little town in northern Israel. Okay, so we're going to see kind of a little backstory here that we don't always get. I want to start reading in chapter 14, verses 23 through 27. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, became king of Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat. That's Jeroboam the first who was wicked. He didn't turn away from any of that which had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lemo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amity, the prophet of gath Kepher, The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slay or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel, yet under heaven he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. All right. Let's see if we can kind of put some meat on this and, and figure this out. If I'm reading this right, and I understand what's going on here, if we have it straight, even though Israel has been led away 
and, and are straying from the path God would have them to go on. And who are they being led away from, from God? Well, from this evil and wicked king. Okay, so this vile and wicked king is leading them astray, Jeroboam II. But yet Jeroboam II is able to go and reclaim the border towns to the, to the north. In, in essence, he's going to be able to restore Israel to the boundary lines that were set up during the reign of King Solomon, when King Solomon was, was really in charge in, in the region. And they were, were, were spreading out. Slowly but surely, these lands have been taken over by bigger and more powerful countries. But the Lord is going to allow them, because he hears what's going on with his people, he's going to go in and save them and allow this vile and wicked king to lead the charge to go in and reclaim these lands. Why? The reason for Jeroboam's strategic and military success lies in the divine compassion for suffering people. He sees their condition. He sees what's going on. He sees how they're being oppressed. And he says, no one else can do anything about this. I'm going to step in. And so I'm going to, even though they deserve my wrath, they deserve my judgment, that's what they've earned. I'm going to put that desire to inflict that judgment, I'm going to have to put that on the back burner because they're still my people. And my compassion is greater than my desire at this point for my judgment. Now, if they continue on, that's a different story. At this point, I'm going to put what they deserve on the back burners and go forward to help them. I'm even going to use this wicked king to, to make this thing happen. So in his mercy, God is free to save whoever, whenever, and whenever. That's his prerogative. Even though it's laid down here, the covenant relationship, and what will happen, God still has the choice to exercise that. He's the one that, that wrote the book of law. So he can either follow that, or he can say, a greater desire of mine at this point is to save these people instead of giving them the judgment that they deserve. And so he allows Jeroboam to go in and, and really uses his desire to be this conqueror, to be this great leader. He uses that, even though he's a wicked and vile person. The Lord uses him as a tool to accomplish what he chooses to do. Now let's look at a pattern. A pattern that's going to be important. Important for the story that the children just got through telling us. Israel is delivered by the word of God. This is giving us an insight as to what's important to God. So God says, this is what's on my heart. And so therefore, this is what I want to do. So the word of God is laid out. That then gets spoken through the mouth of Jonah. So we have God sending down to his representative, this is what I think is important. Now you've got to go and speak on my behalf as to where I am, what's going on in my heart, how I'm viewing everything. God's up here, uses his spokesman, spokesman then goes out, and this, this expanding of the lands that the prophet is announcing is going to take place by the hand of Jeroboam. You see how this works? There's not a connection between God, the one that has the, the, the plan, the desire for this to take place, there's not a relationship between them and the king. He can't speak directly to him. He has to go through an intermediary. Someone that has a connection with the king, serves in his court, serves as an official to come in to be the, the mouthpiece for God. And he has a connection with God. So Jonah becomes this crucial character to hold hands with the two things in order for God's plans to be executed and to be carrying out. Well, I'm guessing Jonah though he knew his fellow countrymen didn't deserve the mercy and, and didn't deserve the protection of Yahweh, when he gets this word, he's like, well, you know what? There are some perks to being God's holy people. Because Israel was described by God as first, you're my people, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6. They're also called my handiwork. Okay, Everything that has come through his hand, 
So everything that has been blessed, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 14, says it comes from the hand of God. So we have every good and perfect gift comes from God, and God's also the creator of, of the heavens and earth, and he raises up this new generation. They are his people, and they are his handiwork. And finally, in Deuteronomy 32, and verse 9, they're called my heritage. So the people of God are my people, my handiwork, my heritage. So Jonah's like, oh, okay, well, it makes sense. If you use these words to describe us, it only makes sense that even though we don't deserve it, you help us. You let the nations know because we have a connection with you, the, the deck has been stacked in our favor. So that's what Jonah is thinking. So in a way, the Lord owed it to Israel to stick up for them. At least that's how Jonah, Israel's prophet, saw it. Jonah 1, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amity. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Nineveh? The, back when we had turntables and stuff, this is the needle going across it in Jonah's mind. What just happened here? It made sense when you intervened. It made sense when you gave mercy. It, it made sense when you gave us a little grace because we're your people. But now you're asking me to go do the exact same thing with the Assyrians going into Nineveh. Nineveh was a huge city in the evil Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire was at its greatest peak you know, around the 8th and 7th century B.C. And so as they're growing and, and just becoming this huge mass going across, these people were vile. And during their per period of ascendancy, a serious imperialistic ambition knew no bounds. And these guys were ruthless. The kings would, would actually brag in, in their writings of what they would do to the people that they're conquering. And so that they would almost get together and, and, and compare notes as to how despicable that they could be. And how they were just horrible to the people they were doing this. And so you've got these gruesome punishments that are inflicted on, the, on these conquered people. So you've got this huge mass off to the east. And there's little Israel that lived in the shadow of constant fear about Assyria. How bad did the Israelites despise the people of Nineveh? Well, consider, if you want to, you can flip over to Nahum. It's a little book way towards the end of the Old Testament. And we're going to read just a little passage from Nahum that describes just how despicable these people were and what most Jews wanted to happen to the people of Nineveh. This is in Nahum chapter 3 and verse 5. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I'm going to lift up your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will, put, I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh's in ruins, but who's going to mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to find comfort for you? You guys have been so despicable. You have no friends left. And now that you're getting yours from the Lord, good riddance. Who cares? Who could care less? You've been such a vile people, detestable in all your practices. And now that you have the wrath of God coming on you, good, we're excited. Go get them, Lord. Pull up that skirt and embarrass them for all the things that they've done. That's how Israel feels. Even one of his prophets. But yet, he says, I want you to go to Nineveh. I, I just have a real heart and a passion for these people. Can, can you go and, and, and preach to them? Tell them what's going to happen? So there you got Jonah going, you got to be kidding. Are you serious? Why not? He led a successful campaign in Israel. And if we uh, apply the formula from 2 Kings 14, it, it's going to look like this. And this is kind of what God's thinking. Okay, we, we still have the word of God. This is what I desire. It may not be what you desire. This is what I desire. This is because of what's on my mind. And like before, that's what's in my heart that I pass on to you. That's going to come out of your mouth, the mouth of Jonah, in order for the Ninevites 
to repent. It worked for his home country. Why wouldn't it work here? Only problem, the eastbound mouth of God is heading out west. He's catching a schooner out of town. He's hopping on a boat saying, I'm going in exactly the opposite direction. Well, if this is clear, we know the word of God. And we know Jonah is designed to go and connect with these people. Why didn't he go? Why didn't he go in the exact opposite direction? Well, I, just looking at human nature, we, we can kind of speculate on a few things. Uh, one is fear. If these guys are really that detestable, can you imagine walking into this pagan metropolis? And, and you know, not, uh, I, I don't know who I'm supposed to talk to, but I need to talk with someone higher up. Who? Do you, do you guys have like a ruler? You mean the king? Yeah, can you let me into the king? I, I need to tell him. What do you need to tell him? Um, well, you, you guys are going to change your ways uh, or Yahweh's going to wipe you out. Who's Yahweh? Well, just trust me. You don't want to mess with him. Okay, well, we'll take you right into the king. That'd be a very scary thing, you would think. But I don't know. We read more in this scripture, in the story of Jonah, three times. Jonah's like, I don't care. I'm not doing this. Kill me before I go do this. Just take me out. I don't think it's fear. Well, perhaps it's futility. What's the point? They're not going to listen. I can see their lifestyle. I know what they're up to. I know what drives those people. I know what their gods are, and it looks nothing like my God. So I'm going to go tell them about my God, and they're just going to go, forget that. I'm not. So it's futile. So it, it's either fear or it's futility. Either way, I'm not going to go. I want to present a third option. I think the reason that Jonah didn't want to go is he doesn't want Nineveh to receive forgiveness in the favor of God. He doesn't want them to have what Israel has. He flat doesn't. Why do I think this? Well, after in, indeed he goes and he preaches his message and the people repent of their sins, you'd think that <laughs> Jonah would be excited. Oh, Lord, I was all wrong. They, they welcomed me in. And, and, and Lord, they, I didn't think they'd listen, but they did. Yes, score one for God. That's not what happens. Jonah 3 and verse 10 says this. When God saw what they did and how the Ninevites, they, they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That's why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. How does he know that God's gracious? How does he know that he's compassionate? How does he know that he's slow to anger? He just got through seeing it. He knew that the people of Israel didn't deserve what God gave them. He knew. He knew the heart of God. And he says, I love that, Lord. I love your grace. I love your forgiveness. For me and mine. Not for these guys. So he flees because he doesn't want them to have what Israel has. He said the bad people, they deserve judgment. Well, Yahweh, he gives to the good and chosen people the compassion that comes from him. I mean, Jonah had even seen when he had been thrown over seas, he, he was going to drown, but yet this giant fish comes and gets him. And he thanks God, says, God, you gave me grace. I didn't deserve it. I was running from you. You show me compassion, but now that you're doing it for someone else, I don't like it. I don't like it. Well, what, what's the missing piece here? What, what's kind of going on? Why is he so upset about this? Why, why was he upset with the heart, the goodness of God being extended to these people? Why did he go and, and sulk when, when they turned back to the Lord? I think he didn't want them to be saved. 
he had been raised in such a culture in such a way that every time he heard about these people, it just burned within him. He had been told about how vile these people are. He'd been told how wicked they are. He'd been told that they were pagan. And now that they're coming around, he doesn't like it. Why? Because he wants God's exclusive love to be reserved for he and his people. That's the way it's always been. It's always been us against the world. Us is me and God. The Jews and God. We've got this monopoly on God. We're exclusively his. At least supposed to be. And God's exclusively ours. And no one can, can conquer us. We hear stories about Joshua going up. And we walk past his kids and see the walls of Jericho and the rubble and say, God did that to these pagan people. But now you've got the pagan people coming to God and it messes up his whole worldview. But yet God is changing. He's trying to mess with what's happening. A few years later, Isaiah the prophet would pin these words in Isaiah 19, verses 22 through 25. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord, and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. In that day, there was going to be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, the two world powers that have caused more grief and more fear in the life of Judah and Israel have been Egypt and Assyria. There's going to be a highway going. The Syrians will go to Egypt, and the Egyptians will go to Assyria. The Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together. Isn't that great? Our two sworn enemies are going to be there worshiping together. What is God up to? In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord will bless them and say, Blessed be Egypt, my people. Assyria, my handiwork. In Israel, my inheritance. Wait, wait, wait. Egypt, my people. Assyria, my hand. Those were descriptors that were for us. And us alone. God, what's going on? We're exclusive. You don't care about anyone else around us. We have a monopoly. The monopoly's over. We go back and look at Scripture. The monopoly was never there. Genesis 22 and verse 18. Abram's call to be a father of faith was never intended to be a faith unto itself, to just be there. But rather through Abraham's offspring, it says all nations on earth could be blessed. God intended for the calling of the Jews to come and to be a holy and special nation. Yes, it receives special favor in order to display, to be an object lesson like we do up here on stage sometime to the nation to say, look what it means if you worship God. This is the, what it means. You enter into the promised land. You'll be blessed. You will live, live a holy life. You will be unique among the nations so that everyone else can come and bring glory to the Heavenly Father. The Jews were commissioned to be a light unto the Gentiles. That's not just Paul. This has been God's plan all along. In Isaiah 49 and verse 6, to be a light unto the Gentiles, that God's salvation could be taken to the ends of the earth. God says, I'm not going to just bring favor for you and allow it to stay here. These blessings weren't designed for you to hoard. These blessings weren't designed just to say, yeah, we have a special connection. No, it's supposed to flow out. It's supposed to be a light unto the nations. To point others, not to themselves, but to serve like Jonah as a vessel between those that don't know God and those that do so they could connect. So they could hold hands with the Heavenly Father and also hold hands with each of the nations to bring them to Him. And God says, if my people are going to do it, I'm going to do it on my own. So He sends Jonah to begin this. In spite of the reluctance of Jonah, all 120,000 of the Ninevites repented and were saved. A couple of points and lessons yours. Number one, in every case, God makes the first move. Scripture never indicates that there was something, a seed that was being planted among the Syrians. They were kind of more open, more welcome. They, they had some signs. That, well, maybe they're reachable. No, they were bad people. There was nothing on the outside you could point to and say, well, they, there's a kernel of goodness. Nope. God says they're a despicable people, but I love them. 
and I want you to love them too. Even though everything you see about them is evil, is nothing like you, he says, I'm going to love them first, just like I loved you first. God always makes the first move. The Bible tells us they were wicked people, and God went after them anyway. He wants to bestow upon them his love and his compassion instead of the wrath and destruction that they deserve. Who else deserved that? God's people, but he still allowed Jeroboam to protect the people and expand the borders. They didn't deserve that. You think Jonah would have picked up on that? We didn't deserve this. So, um, well, they don't deserve it either, but hey, I'm going to keep doing this. We, we've got to realize God always makes the first move. Number two, true repentance brings about restitution. This is something, I, I keep bringing this up, but there's such a lie that's out there that we've done something that's beyond God loving us and beyond God being able to pull us back in. The, the people of Nineveh were terrible, but yet he reaches out to them. They heard Jonah's sermon. Basically, his sermon was, 40 more days, Nineveh's going to be destroyed. So the people all sit around, and it's not just a few of the poor people that are more open to the gospel. Man, it was everyone, all the way up to the king. The king gets out among the people. He sits down in a pile of dirt and ash, wearing sackcloth. His crown is nowhere to be found. Royal robes? Mm Mm-mm. He's sitting right next to the poorest person in town. They're sitting there. How serious were they about their asking God to humble them and, and asking God for forgiveness? Said so they even put together outfits for the cows. If the Lord was looking down, it wasn't just the people, he saw on all the cattle on the hillside, they're wearing these little sackcloths. Can you imagine them sewing together sackcloth to make little animal costumes so that everywhere you look, there's no doubt about it, we are a humbled people. Because they did that, true repentance came about and they were restored. Number three, this is for us. Salvation has to extend beyond you and yours and me and mine. It does. We have a little board down in the office that records those that are baptized throughout the year. And it's exciting. We see kids it's it's almost like popcorn kernels and they'll be sitting there simmering for years and some pop early and some a little later and some way later but they they pop and we celebrate with these families and we all gather around we need to celebrate with some folks that are simmering outside of this campus some folks that desperately need someone to be bringing the gospel to them to be bringing those folks in and, and to do all that we can to help them Salvation has to go, go beyond that. I think we fall, sometimes fall into a trap as Israel, believing that God likes us better. Somehow America is a chosen nation through which God works. Church of Christ is his favorite denomination or non-denomination. I think one of the purposes of this book is to challenge the audience assumption That God only loves them. It it couldn't be more untrue. They alone are saved and all others are doomed. Sometimes we look on the news. It's hard for us not to feel some of those things. To say, oh my, look at what they're doing over there. Boy, those people are going to get there someday. Glad we are God's chosen nation. But you know, God was active back then in reaching some folks that no one wanted reached. God is active today. Whether we put our head in the sand or not, there are people on the front lines and there are churches on the front lines and there are people that are going after them whole hog, trying to reach people that others say aren't reachable. We've got to join in in that. We, like Jonah, have the message from God. And we, we simply can't say, well, you know what? Either... We would never say, we don't want them to know, but we do kind of lay that, well, I'm, I'm kind of afraid, or I, I'm not sure how productive it, it'd be, so I'm just going to kind of hold this. And, and if I run across someone who is, seems open, well, then I'll, I'll share. 
And, and definitely I'm going to talk with my kids and my grandkids because I, I want them to have it. But beyond that, I, I just got to kind of do what's best for us and, and hope someone comes to me. I was at Jim Band's shop yesterday. I thought this was awesome. I should, should have put a picture up. But he's got the different prices for uh, his caning and, and the stuff he does to repair chairs and stuff, his hourly rate. And so he puts what everything is on the bottom. It says, uh, but I'll tell you about my faith for free. He's getting out there. And he's putting it out there. If you come in here and you stay too long, look, look out, you're going to hear about Jesus in my shop. This is my place. Go somewhere else. Of course, no one else canes in this, uh, the southeast. So you, you'll have to come to me and hear about Jesus. We, we've got to get out there. You know, we can no longer afford to privatize our faith. It, it can't just be about my relationship with God. It can't just be about what I'm doing with my family. You, your family can do whatever you want. It, it can't even be about a, a small collection of believers. We've got to raise up our eyes to see what God is doing across the city, across the state, across this nation, and across the world. We've got to be tuned in. What a breath of fresh air it was to have in, have in Brother Food to talk about what's happening over in China and what's happening on the front lines out there. We've got to be thinking, praying, and hoping that God is, is working and being a part of, of what God is trying to do to expand His kingdom worldwide. Today we're going to offer an invitation on Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, a lot of the believers will get together and they'll read the book of Jonah. Why would they do that on the Day of Atonement? It's urging repentance. Repentance from sin. To say we're going to be serious about our relationship with God. But it's also a reminding and a repentance from shirking from their calling to be light bearers unto the nations. To be carriers of the message so this morning, if you find yourself like the people of Nineveh, desperately in need of a Savior, you've come to the right place. We'd love to share our faith with you about that. Or if you, like Jonah, have been running from God, running after our calling to spread the good news, we'd love for you to come forward this morning. All of us could respond to this, but if you in particular want to come forward and ask for prayers that God would open up a door for you in the next few days, next few weeks, months, and years, that whatever time you've got left, you want God to passionately use you to connect with others. We'd love to pray over you. Whatever your needs are this morning, as you come now as we stand and as